Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest Service Department News webinar. Today's session is called US Extended Stay, Will the Bubble Burst? A slightly provocative title, and we're going to find out the answer, I'm sure. Um, US Extended Stay has actually been one of the real shining stars of the hospitality world over the last couple of years, and we're going to have a deep dive uh, into how the segment's been performing. My name's George Stell. I'm editor of Service Department News and editor-in-chief at International Hospitality Media. And we are a London-based publisher of B2B news sites for the hospitality and real estate sectors. And we also organize uh, conferences and awards. Now, this SAN webinar series is sponsored by IMS. And you can see uh, their details uh, in the chat to find out more about them. And we're just gonna watch a quick video to find out more about what they do. Okay, thanks very much to IMS. So today's webinar is going to last an hour. We're going to have around about a 45 minute panel discussion. Um, we'd like it to be as inter interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A or the chat functions in Zoom. And we'll either get around to answering them towards the end of the session or as we go along, depending on if they're relevant to the, the topic we're on at the time. Uh, everyone who's registered for the session will receive a link to a recording of it in the next couple of days. So just to give the conversation some context, I'm just gonna show a few screen grabs from stories that we've run on service department news uh, over the last couple of years. Um, quite a few of them actually pertain to the panelists who we've got on the session today. And as you can see, they're, they're to do with new brand launches, uh, rebrands, investor activity in the, in the sector and acquisitions um, and also some performance data which has come from market highland group as you, you can see there's one there that says extended stay hotels continue to lead us recovery that was from november last year and while there has been um and rightly so there's been a lot of praise for how the sector has performed during and coming out of the pandemic it's worth mentioning that, that you know this isn't actually a new thing. Here's some, uh, a story about some more data from the Highland Group that came out literally a couple of weeks before the pandemic really kicked in. Um, an occupancy across the sector there was at a 19 year high. So this fantastic performance isn't just uh, a result of the, of the pandemic. So let's introduce you to our panelists today. We've got a bit of a powerhouse panel going on here. What these gentlemen don't know about extended stay probably isn't worth knowing. Uh, I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves in turn and we'll go from left to right as we see them on the slide here. So uh, Matt, would you like to go first? Good afternoon to you or good morning I should say. Well, you yeah, good, morning. good morning, good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me on the panel. 
Uh, my name is Matt Macklear. I'm the Senior Director uh, for Extended State Brands at Choice Hotels. Uh, Choice represents roughly one in 10 of all open hotels in the United States, and we have over 7,000 franchise hotels globally. Um, within the extended stay space, we have, we're approaching 500 open hotels uh, across four brands, um, our Suburban Studios brand and Wood Spring Suites brand uh, in economy and in the mid-scale space, Mainstay Suites, as well as our newly launched Everhome Suites brand. Um, we've got 300 projects being actively developed in addition to those 500-ish uh, that are open. Um, and my role at Choice really has been to, uh, to really create a center of excellence for extended stay within the company. Um, in the last five years, we've went from one dedicated extended stay resource to nearly 50, and that spans real estate and development all the way through uh, performance support, global sales, and marketing. Um, and so I'm responsible for that strategy as well as our brand-specific uh, strategies and positioning. Thanks. Great stuff. Thank you, Matt. Mark S. Good afternoon. Good morning to you. Good morning, George and everyone else. Thank you very much for putting this on. Um, I'm a partner with the Highland Group. Uh, we are a hotel consulting and research firm, been uh, uh, doing this since 1989 and about uh, 25, 27 years ago, we started specializing in the, ex in the extended stay sector and have been publishing uh, annual, quarterly, and now monthly reports uh, on the segment. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Kurt, good morning to you. Good afternoon, George. Good morning, everyone. A pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation uh, for me to join. Um, my name is Kurt Albert, Senior Vice President of Finance at Wyndham Hotels and Resorts. Uh, we're based out of New Jersey, and we're the world's largest hotel franchiser with uh, nearly 9,000 hotels around the world. Um, I've been with the organization for about 12 years in a variety of roles in the finance group. And most recently, I've been part of a cross-functional team that we stood up uh, almost a year ago at this point, um, which was assembled to focus on how we could ex expand and enhance our presence in the extended, spa in extended stay space. Um, this has ultimately led to the launch of, of our project ECHO, which we, we've announced earlier this year, and, and I'm sure we'll get into more of that uh, later on. Thanks, Kurt. And finally, Mark F, and it's especially early for you, so thank you very much for coming on. Absolutely. Uh, so my name is Mark Fraioli. I'm uh, with Mission Hill Hospitality, a relatively new uh, platform. We are a uh, wholly controlled portfolio company of KSL Capital Partners, which is a, a Denver-based travel and leisure private equity investor with uh, more than $6 billion in assets under management. The, uh, the Mission Hill uh, platform was created uh, about 18 months ago with its first acquisition uh, about 12 months ago uh, for the purpose of owning select service hotels, which in, in our rubric includes the, the transient select service as well as extended stay. Uh, we recently completed our 19th hotel acquisition and should be at 21 by the end of the month. Uh, so our, my perspective on this is more as a investor and buyer rather than a, a franchisor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, so Mark S, as you mentioned, you have been compiling data on this segment for uh, a, a, couple, a good couple of decades now. But can you give us a, a kind of snapshot on, on how the sector has performed um, since, since the pandemic started, how it's coming out of it, and how it also particularly how it's performing relative to other um, areas of, of hospitality? Uh, yes. Um, I think, first of all, it's important to uh, break out the extended stay uh, sector itself into three components because they've performed differently. Mm -hmm. Economy, mid-price and upscale. Um, if you look at the economy segment and you compare it uh, to all economy hotels, the revenue losses during and revpar losses during 2020 uh, were were a tiny fraction of it. Um, I think one fifth is uh, of the uh, of the comparable revpar loss. If you look at mid price against mid price uh, mid price extended stay hotels against all mid price, they also lost far less re revenue, and so did upscale. But coming out into 2021. 
Uh, the economy segment has already surpassed 2019 RevPAR levels. We see a lot of comparative benchmarking statistics of the overall hotel industry. How is it doing compared to the last high watermark? Well, the economy segment has recovered all of its RevPAR plus about 20%. The mid-price segment has recovered all of its RevPAR uh, and is one of the strongest performing uh, segments of the hotel industry. The upscale extended stay hotel segment is about 90, 91% of 2019 Rev Park currently. Now, one of the main reasons for that is the distribution of product. Uh, upscale extended stay hotels, which account for about 40% of extended stay supply, have a much higher proportion of, of product in urban centers which we all know have, take, uh, have struggled to recover relative to the overall hotel industry. So I think that's the single biggest factor uh, that's hindering that recovery. But it's important to also note that they are doing better than all upscale hotels. So collectively, the, the segment has done extraordinarily well, but there are differing performance factors within that segment. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. Um, Matt, did you want to come in and, and talk about the relative yeah. importance of your brands in, in those segments? Yeah, I think it's 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 interesting what you know market share, and it's really a it's the the best way to think about it um, in terms of kind of a framework for the resiliency um, by category is sort of a continuum where the higher the price point, uh, the more performance is correlated to to sort of a traditional hotel, um, and at the lower price points, the more the fundamentals, the risk profile. Uh, is is more non-discretionary and more almost more multifamily, and it really is sort of a hybrid of the two. Um, and what what we saw with our performance over the last two years um, is, you know, we're, we're we have roughly forty five percent of the market share in economy extended stay, uh, and that's mostly Wood Spring, which is which I think has been the best performing brand in the industry. But really, twenty twenty was about the fact that the R core traveler never stopped traveling. Uh, the the types of folks that stay in Condi extended stay hotels, they travel because they have to, not because they want to. So that non-discretionary demand really showed itself with a high floor and a quick bounce back where, you know, by the end of 2020, we were at 2019 levels in, in that category. Um, 2021, I think, is interesting because it's about rec it's been about record-breaking performance. Um, I think there was a product trial that happened in 2020 and a preference developed for extended stay. And you saw that propel us even further, where if you look at our biggest brand, Woodspring, we hit 60% gross operating profit uh, in the portfolio in 2021. And we had over 235 straight days of occupancy over 80%, with RevPAR up, you know, in line with a category of about 20% over 19 levels. So it's, it really has been incredible to see how we were able to not just get back to 2019, but really propel forward in 2021. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Um, Mark F, you, you've got quite um, a broad portfolio in terms of the brands uh, and the segments. Have you noticed significant differences in how they have performed and how, how they've recovered? Well, we have, and I think it's along the lines of what Mark Skinner was saying. The uh, extended stay forms about 35% of our portfolio to date. And you know, within that, the the properties that uh, are extended stay are actually performing a little bit behind some of our transient uh, properties, and the reason for it is that you know the the vast majority of our extended stay investments tend to be in corporate markets or urban centers, whereas many of our our, our more transient lodging investments tend to be on beaches and mountains and places where people have already been vacationing for the last. Twelve months, and so we are seeing that differential, but we don't we don't think that it, it's sustained. And and certainly, you know these these products, uh, you know, performed very well, you know, through the uh, through the downturn, you know, through the pandemic, uh, and compared favorably the, the extended stay, extended stay products compared favorably to the performance of of uh, hotels with shorter stays, and specifically because of the number of amenities that are inside the room. Thanks, Mark. Kurt, did you want to come in on that point? 
Yeah, I just want to add what, to what everyone has, has mentioned already is, is that just the strength, particularly on the economy side that we saw, um, you know, in 2021, I think for the full year across the segment as a whole, occupancies were approached almost 80%, which which were levels that that no other segment was even close to seeing. And, and going back even further, you know, all the way through 2018, there's <clears> never been a quarter that the segment has been under 70%. So throughout the pandemic, before the pandemic, after the pandemic, uh, and so there's not the seasonality that, that the rest of the kind of core hospitality industry does see. So it's just a very consistent uh, you know, business model and a very consistent product, you know, quarter after quarter. Mm -hmm. Mark S, is this phenomenal um, growth and performance in the economy sector, does that have as much to do perhaps with the, the dynamics of the housing market in the US and a housing shortage as, as it does with demand for a hospitality product? Uh, yes, it's a significant factor. Uh, the economy segment uh, has always essentially had uh, a large proportion of residential guests. And if you can loosely define that as anyone staying 30 consecutive nights or longer. And um, the, the housing crisis uh, has always been here, but it's been somewhat regional. The Northeast and California have been uh, uh, dealing with that for, for many, many years. But now what we're seeing is, is it's basically nationwide. So uh, there's been a significant increase in long-term guests in uh, economy and, you know, actually I would say lower mid-price if you were to segment it, it, it there as well. In other words, if you were to take there's 570,000 extended stay hotel rooms in the US open today. If you were to cut that in half and take the lower priced half, there's been a significant increase in, in the amount of long-term guests there and rising rents. Uh, we just did some work in, in Tampa, uh, which is 2 million people. I mean, it's a significant MSA. And the, the, the reports came back and average apartment rent went up 30% in 2021 compared to 20. Well, that's going to cause significant displacement. So it, it is definitely a factor. And is there a correlation, but do you think, between the availability of, of, of multifamily properties and, and rental apartments, or, or it's more a, a price generated issue? Uh, it's both. It's both. What, what you see is when, when apartment vacancies shrink, shall we say, in the B and C quality apartments. They then tighten up their guest acceptance criteria with deposits, they raise deposits, they, they increase uh, um, verification of income levels and so forth. And it can push um, people who are on the margin into alternative accommodation. And the, 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 the place of choice very often is an economy extended stay hotel. It's also important to note that economy hotels in general are also accommodating a significant portion of these of, of, of this type of guest, particularly in markets which don't have a, a lot of economy extended stay hotels. Once again, uh, the Pacific, you know, particularly California and the Northeast have very, very low proportions of economy extended stay hotels. So in many cases, the, the lower priced traditional hotels are accommodating these guests. Okay, that's interesting. Matt, did you want to come in on that point? Yeah, Mark, Mark started to go there uh, relative to the fact that this is, uh, it's more of a widespread than just in the extended stay because of the um, insufficient supply of economy extended stay hotels. And yeah. um, I, can add, I can add a data point in as well. Um, you know, there are over, there are about 650 STR tracks in the United States. Over 300 of them do not have any economy, branded economy extended stay product. Uh, so the opportunity set is huge to add supply there. And, you know, relative to the housing shortage, um, last data that we, we saw was that there's 37 affordable rentals available for every 100 households that need them. So it's, it's, a, it's a trend that's going to take multiple cycles to, uh, to correct for an economy extended stay. And, you know, those lower mid-priced hotels fill that gap in a lot of markets, particularly as jobs have sort of consolidated around those major kind of urban centers yeah yeah and this is something that hasn't gone 
unnoticed by the big in investment houses. Obviously, I, I guess the the main story of the last couple of years has been the Blackstone and Starwood Capital a acquisition of Extended Stay America for, for six billion dollars. Um, those guys have also been active buying up. I think they bought a portfolio from from Brookfield. Um, Blackstone has also bought a separate portfolio from Condor, I believe. So they they're clearly seeing the opportunity. Um, Mark Skinner, do you, is investor sentiment towards the sector as as bullish as it's ever been? And, and what do you think we're likely to see in the next couple of years in terms of um, acquisitions and you know, M and A activity? Um, yes, in, investor uh, um, uh, sentiment is is very bullish. Uh, cap rates have gone down. Um, asset values on a per room basis have gone up. I think you'll continue to see that, uh, certainly in, in the near term. Uh, you are probably going to see uh, some new brands spring up, um, maybe additional ones with a regional focus. I think you may see some acquisitions into the segment again, and br brand extensions are a possibility. And then the, just the growth uh, in, in brands as well. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let's move on and, and, and talk about new brands because um, Kurt's got one that's so new it hasn't even got a name yet. It's still a, it's still a code name, which is quite exciting. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that, Kurt? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so, so Project Echo, which, which as you mentioned, George, is a, is a code name, will be uh, Wyndham's twenty third brand. It's, it's a brand that we announced uh, publicly about a month ago now, um, and and for us, it's an economy extended state product so, and which is our, our sweet spot in terms of our portfolio. So we have about 50% of our portfolio in the economy space already. And so adding this type of brand there just, just made sense. Um, so, so we are developing a brand that will be 100% new construction, prototypically built, and really most importantly, something that we feel will be the most efficient uh, prototype in the, in, in the industry. Um, something that we've worked hard on over the last nine months to make sure uh, in conjunction with the developer council we, we spent the time and effort uh, to be able to build a, a product and, and spec a product that, that developers want to build and can build so efficiently to drive the type of returns that they are expecting. You know, we touched on in, in the last question about, you know, the investor and the developer sentiment in the, in the industry. You know, what we know is that the, the developers of an extended state product, particularly in the economy space, are not the same owners and developers that are, are buying and running and operating normal, traditional, transient economy and, and mid-scale hotels. This is, there's a very high investment focus. Um, it is all about driving profitability, maximizing a cash-on-cash -cash return. And so we feel like, like Project Echo will do that. We've already signed our first 50 hotels with two strategic partners, um, and we are, are planning to have the first handful of hotels break ground later this year, which puts us into position to, to have hotels up and running, you know, by the end of next year and in, in many cases and most likely. So, so we see tremendous growth potential with the brand and we've touched on some of the big players in, in the space, Wood Springs, the ESAs, you know, they have hotels in, in the hundreds um, from each of the brands and their portfolios. And at the same time, there is the untapped market potential um, within the different SDR tracks that Matt touched on a, a few minutes ago. So we are, we are excited. Um, the, the reaction from developers has been uh, overwhelmingly positive and, and we're, we're ready to go. Excellent. I think Project Echo is a pretty cool name, personally. I might be tempted to stick with that, but uh, you know, you know more about it than I do. Um, Matt, you you also launched a new a new brand literally a couple of months before the the pandemic kicked off, and you've also um, refreshed one of your brands, the Suburban Studios brand. H how has the Everhome Suites um, flag progressed, considering the the timing that that that, uh, that you launched it? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Pat, Pat was asked this question at Hunter and he had a, a great metaphor where it was, you know, effectively a, an extended ring delay um, from, from the time we kicked it off with, you know, roughly 14 projects in the pipeline to where we are now. Um, but we're, we're picking up traction this year. We'll have our first Everhome Suites open uh, in Southern California uh, in, in this, this summer. And we'll have another six or seven in the ground this year that will open next year uh, throughout the country. Um, and really, Everhome Suites, there's, you know, Mark talked about mid-scale extended stay, um, but really you could split that almost into two, two separate categories based on price point. And there's a, there's a big opportunity in kind of core mid-scale. Um, over 40% uh, of the product 
um, is, is 15 plus years old. Um, and over 50% is over 10 plus years old. So it's dated product bearing core mid scale. And most of the supply growth has really been at the upper mid scale level with the home to and newer town place product. And, and those, those assets, they, they run a much lower extended stay occupancy. It's not quite the same model that attracts the, the folks that Kurt mentioned that you know, are, are in it for the, the return on, on cash. Uh, so Everhome is really meant to fit into that core mid scale place. And it's built on the wood spring chassis. And it's really a, the, the combination of choices, mid-scale leadership, and that wood spring operating model. Uh, so we're really excited about that and should see growth really ramp up now that, um, you know, financing and some of the other the headwinds have sort of receded. Um, and then another opportunity, we just rebranded our Suburban brand um, to Suburban Studios and we've got a new visual identity and really a new go-to-market strategy uh, for that brand. And, you know, we talked about supply demand imbalance uh, and, and the lack of economy products. Uh, there are a lot of traditional hotels that are sitting in those awesome economy extended stay markets that have just gone through two years of potentially, you know, sluggish performance where the, the investment thesis or the repositioning thesis to move into, you know, the economy uh, extended stay space is there. And Suburban Studios is meant to, to address that, that opportunity with what we call our kitchen in a box, uh, where we've worked with architects, engineers, developers, contractors to figure out the, the cheapest, most efficient way to fit the extended stay room into a traditional hotel footprint. Uh, so we're really excited about that and having 20 in the pipeline already um, and expect that to ramp up significantly um, in the coming months. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, Kurt, Wyndham has also launched um, the, the dual branded um, product with Hawthorne, Hawthorne Suites and and La Quinta, is that, is that something that you're seeing a lot of demand for? And is this sort of double decker, as, as, uh, as we call it over here, is, is this a, um, a, a frequent part of the market over there in the States? Uh, it, it definitely is, and especially on the, the dual branded side. And so we're, we're really proud and, and happy with the traction we've seen um, with our, our Hawthorne brand and some of the work we've done there from a, a prototype refresh standpoint. Um, which, which from a dual brand standpoint, really pairs nicely with our La Quinta and the Del Sol prototype that we have uh, for that product. Um, so, so we've got a, a strong pipeline there. We've got, got more than, than 30 or 40 projects in, in the pipeline that are on the dual branded side of things. And that does help us capture the, that mid-scale guest that Matt just touched on. And so between the Hawthorne uh, product and the mid-scale, between Project Echo and the economy space, you know, we've really rounded out uh, our extended stay gamut of, of brands. Thanks, Kurt. Um, Mark F., as a buyer of hotels, how important to you, considering there is such demand for extended stay products at the moment, how important is it to you to have a brand over the door? Or could you, could you run them at 90% occupancy w w without a recognized brand? It's a little bit of a, of a difficult question from my perspective because our platform was you know, designed really to, to, at least at the outset, to focus on branded products. And so by definition, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, but you know, I, I will acknowledge that in, in many destination markets, uh, it's certainly when you're you know, traveling to a, a place because you want to be you know, near the, the town center or you want to be near the beach, then an independent uh, positioning can, can do you just fine uh, and will Will allow you to attract similar levels of demand at, at much less expense. Uh, you know, I, within the, the 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 world of of branded hotels, you know, I, I will say that you know some some extended say brands, uh, and particularly the ones that we invest in, you know, have very strong followings. And that's that's been uh, you know that's that's really been attractive to us. Uh, you know, to to take one you know, example, you you could compare. You know, residents in to courtyard over over the years, and you know their residents in Rev Bar has usually been at a something like a fifteen percent you know premium to the courtyard brand um, consistently. You know, I looked at it twenty years ago, and it's pretty much the same premium that it is today. Uh, and um, and so we we're, we're attracted to those you know to to products that can drive that kind of uh, you know that kind of outsized demand. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that's that's particularly interesting about the, some of the extended stay hotels we invest in is that the the loyalty you, you, you kind of asked uh, about 
you know, how, how important is a brand and loyalty. And you know, in some cases, the, the consumer loyalty to the brand is so great that you know, people will build an extended state product in a location that doesn't have extended state business. They just want the brand loyalty. Yeah. And so you know, in any, any airport in the United States, no matter how short the, the guest stay will be, is going to feature extended state hotels because guests are simply attracted to ha having a, a larger a larger room. They're faithful to the brand, and they like the the option of being able to do to do more with their uh, with their overnight stay uh, in terms of you know dining and being able to to kind of spread out than they could in a traditional hotel room. So so we we see the the, the demand driven both by true extended stay needs and also just loyalty. One of the things we, we're starting to see in this sector, perhaps in contrast with the general hotel sector, is having the real estate and the operations under the same ownership. Can you ever foresee a, a point when you get to maybe 50 or 100 hotels that you acquire an operating platform or, or launch your own brand? Uh, it, it's hard to say. Uh, certainly, the uh, we, we have our, our model at the present is... Uh, to rely upon third-party operators for um, for for uh, to, to run our properties, and we have a lot of you know, partnerships with those operators that we really value. Uh, you know, it's um, you know the uh, operations in the, in the select service world uh, are, you know, can be characterized as as simpler because there are fewer moving parts than a, than a full service. Uh, but at the same time, your margin for error is usually reduced as well because the the exceptional cash flow that these properties produce simply means that the, what you're what you're buying is is all cash flow and you got to make sure it stays there so um so we, we 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 monitor our performance of our properties very carefully and they're um and, and directly participate in the revenue management for those properties but um so we've had a very good experience with the third party operators that we've retained uh, so far and our in uh, our portfolio generally is above where we thought it would be at this point in the calendar. Okay, thanks Mark. Um, Mark S, could you give us a snapshot on, on what we're seeing in terms of the evolution of the physical product across the three, across the three tiers uh, of the market? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's becoming more residential, if you like, um, the, you know, the, the, the decor, uh, and uh, technology is increasing, um, the, the, the use of that, um, and um, it's really following the overall, you know, trend of the hotel industry in terms of uh, uh, the furnishings, the fixtures, and so forth, um, and, and, and definitely being modernized. Uh, given, uh, you know, Matt's comment earlier about the age of the product, there is a lot of dated product now in extended stay. This is not a new thing. Mark, do you want to, oh, I can see two hands raised here. Mark, I'll come to you first. You go ahead, Mark. Mark. Mm, so uh, the, the only thing I wanted to add to that, thank, thank you, Mark Skinner. The, you know, the, the only thing I wanted to add to that was that over a, a 20 or 30 year period, We've certainly seen a dramatic change in in what extent stay looks like. It was originally conceived as a more of a garden apartment type format, and now these are uh, much tighter boxes. You know, the a typical you know '80s um, extended stay product might be a five and a half acre site, and in, in, in for example, a generation one residence in would have had 25 percent of its room inventory be two bedrooms. Um, today, you go from a five and a half acre site down to something like two and three quarters, and it would be very typical for 90% of your inventory to be studios with the remaining 10% to be not two bedrooms, but one bedrooms. So the, this, the, the box has compressed. Uh, it's, it's gotten a little bit more, uh, it resembles a bit more a, a traditional hotel than, uh, than some of the ones we've seen in the past, uh, at least in the, in the, ups, in the kind of upscale and and upper mid-scale segments that we focus on. Uh, Matt, are average unit sizes coming down, do you think? Uh, I think there's always gonna be a focus on value engineering. 
um, particularly given just the, the cost pressures from a construction standpoint uh, that we're seeing. Um, you know, on that new construction side, like Kurt mentioned, really, this is this isn't a real estate investment. And so keeping that cost basis at a level where you can run that true extended stay operating model with the long length of stay, potentially lower rev par, but really high fl flow through rev par and get to that cash on cash return. That's the focus. So it's really about maximizing that revenue producing square footage within the, the, the asset, uh, particularly in, in our brands. Um, and Really, one, one area that I think is emerging, and I think the pandemic accelerated it throughout the industry, but particularly within um, extended stay, is really turning that F&B offering into a profit center from a cost center. Um, we've done some research, and, and really what it comes down to, the, the extended stay guest is not making decisions based on F&B at the price points where our brands are. Uh, it's, I think we were at roughly 75% of respondents indicated they cook their breakfast in their room all or most days. Um, and if you're running the model where your uh, proportion of transient business is where it should be, which should be about 15% of your, your revenue mix and economy and about 25 to 30% in mid-scale, you, you want to orient towards that majority. Um, something that we've seen too is around technology and really um, providing you know, smart fridge technology that's controlled access as a way of delivering F&B without stressing a labor model. Um, and the last thing I would mention really is, is around sustainability. Um, that is something that I think is emerging. Um, you do see that more at the higher price points, but I think as time goes on, um, you know, things that minimize energy usage um, and, 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 and that sustainability aspect, even into the physical product is going to become a component that affects purchase decision for guests. So. Um, Kurt, what are you guys doing with Project Echo that's maybe different in terms of, of design and specification from, from other brands? And, and are you responding to the different ways that people are working in now? For example, is there a, a work zone within, within the units? Yeah, you know, I, I think what what's important is that, and, and what we've seen is with which each each new brand and each brand refresh over time, the product has naturally gotten more and more efficient, and that's especially true uh, with everything we've tried to accomplish with with Project Echo. You know, we've we've got a box that can typically fit on a a two acre piece of land or less. We've got a box that has more than seventy five percent or about seventy five percent of the square footage being rentable space. Has the opportunity for additional profit centers that Matt touched on. Um, and really the big also focus is in addition to, to limiting the pressures that, that developers are seeing when the, the project is underway from a construction standpoint is what can we do to minimize the impact or, or maximize the profitability from a labor standpoint. And so how do you efficiently design a public space to, to minimize the amount of actual, uh, you know, employees need to have on a day-to-day -day basis while the hotel is, is running for their, their core hours. Um, so we're working closely with our, our developer council that we stood up to identify um, where they feel there are the biggest opportunities to keep tweaking and improving the products that they have today and, and are trying to combine all of that into what we've done in Project Echo. Thanks, Kurt. Um, Mark Skinner, F&B provision is quite an interesting concept in extended stay. Um, are, are you seeing any trends in, in what um, brands are offering? Um, I think... Uh, uh, you know, uh, Matt's point about um, purchasing uh, food and beverage as opposed to getting a free breakfast at that point, I think that that will develop. Uh, I think that uh, at the upscale end, um, I believe that uh, the manager's reception, uh, that was a four night a week uh, brand standard for almost all of them, will I think Residence Inn has actually stopped it now. I mean, uh, Mark, you probably know they have, haven't they? Yes. So yeah. if they've stopped it, you'll probably see that stop. It may come back in a different format. I've heard, uh, you know, do it because, um, you know, because guest interaction, notwithstanding the pandemic, uh, is very, very important when you've got long term guests there. And I think there was some innovation uh, with perhaps having a food truck uh, come. Uh, one or two nights a week and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but I think you'll see at the upper end, uh, the manager's reception, at least as we knew it, uh, is a thing of the past. Yeah. 
guess the interaction is that, sorry go, go ahead, ahead. But I, if i could just I, I think one thing we're noticing is that that given the labor model and the type of operators that you know are predominant in this segment they do not want to be in the f b business they recognize the need to, to to deliver something for the guest but we've got infinite possibilities on our phone through you know food delivery and the adoption of that's been pulled forward things like food trucks and i think what you'll see the Brands will start to figure out ways to um, either incorporate loyalty, earn and earn and use uh, into some of that, and/or facilitating that for the guests in a way that's higher quality um, and efficient, but to do so in a way that doesn't have a PNL impact, other than potentially some ADR increase because you're providing that service to the to the guests. So, thanks, Mark. Um, Mark F, go ahead. I think you wanted to come in on that one. Yeah, I think that. Um... You know, speaking to the uh, as I as I typically am focused on the kind of you know upscale and upper mid scale segments, you know, particularly in some of the leisure locations that that we own and operate, we're we're finding that there's been a, a good deal of blurring between select service and full service as well. And so certainly, when you get a guest who has you know taken that that one vacation this year and they're really kind of looking forward to having the full experience, and it happens to be you know at a at Hampton and Myrtle Beach, then, you know, our, or, or say an, another uh, extended state property in a similar location, we're finding ourselves building, building out amenities that, um, uh, that might be full service-ish in, in, uh, uh, in, in their nature. But, you know, ultimately that's, that's specifically pointed at guests that are taken, you know, that are in leisure destinations. And are, are looking for kind of the full experience, uh, but as a general rule, we're finding more and more blurring between you know the the select service and extend say segments, and then and then full service where where full service is getting more compact and more efficient. Select service hotels are, are in cases embellishing their offerings a bit. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, Mark Skinner, what what were the trends in average length of stay? before the pandemic how has the pandemic disrupted those trends and are they normalizing now as, as we come out of it um i don't track average length of stay specifically um you know calibri labs has very very good data on that but i would assume that it has gone up considerably uh especially at lower price points because of uh, the increase in long-term guests. It just has to. Uh, I, we were looking at a, a group of uh, economy extended stay hotels uh, yesterday, and two-thirds of the room nights in that group of six uh, hotels were for guests staying 30 nights or longer. Uh, and the data showed that that was about 40% in 2019. So uh, it did increase during the pandemic, um, but it has continued to increase, uh, uh, at least in this group of hotels. And I would assume if, we, if we, we looked at the data at lower price points, that's probably a national trend. Kurt, would you yeah. think that tallies with, with what you're seeing across the Wyndham brands? Yeah, I, I definitely would. Um, you know, what we definitely saw during the pandemic um, across all of our brands was just what Mark touched on is that you had the, the guests and the travelers that were using the space for more of a long-term option anyway, and they were still there because that's what they, they needed. And you had that really sharp decline in, in leisure and, and business travel. Kurt, your audio is... We've lost your sound a bit there, Kurt. We'll come back to you, Kurt. But we, we lost we lost your audio there, unfortunately. Um, Matt, can I can I share a couple of data points? Yeah, please, please do. Yeah. Um, so, in our Woodspring brand versus nineteen, um, we saw average length of stay increase by twenty five percent. In suburban studios, about fifteen percent, and then in our mainstay suites brand, roughly nineteen percent. And a lot of that, to to echo Mark's point, um, is really a, a, in that thirty plus category. Um, and I think what we saw was that given the labor challenges with staffing hotels, that revenue management became a component of labor management in the sense that 
the longer the length of stay, you know, the fewer housekeeping hours you need to turn rooms. Um, and so we saw some of that happen in 2020 out of necessity because that was who was traveling, but our properties have maintained higher than pre-COVID levels of, of call it that monthly guest in that tier four rate. Um, I think, and I think it's partially from a labor perspective. And do you have a minimum length of stay at your brands? Um, at our brands, you know, we, we do take nightly guests. Um, the, the Woodspring brand in its previous kind of version of Value Place actually didn't even allow nightly. Um, but we have, we have teams that are dedicated to extended stay that sort of um, coach, coach our properties to sort of revenue manage towards high stock levels. Um, but, you know, I think there is a place for some, you know, higher ADR business, provided you're not displacing, you know, 15 rooms for five months of a crew that's coming in. So if there's a concert or there's some compression opportunity, we do see hotels, you know, be a little bit more aggressive and take some shorter length of stay business to, to, to juice their rev par. Uh, and that does optimize their, their, their bottom line performance. Yeah, the, the reason I ask, because, because over here in Europe, where a lot of hotels weren't able to continue trading through the pandemic and um, uh, self-contained apartments uh, and, and a more residential offer in a lot of cases were, people were using those who perhaps hadn't experienced a service department, as we would call it, or, or an extended stay room before with, with, with the, the home-like amenities. And now they have they are seeking them out whenever they travel, even if it's only for one or two nights, you know, for leisure. I'm just wondering if that's a trend that's being reflected uh, in the US. Does anybody want to come in on that one? Um, I'd say that's certainly the case. Yeah, I, I would concur. Um, if you look at total extended stay, it's only 10% of US hotel rooms. So it's reasonable to assume there's a lot of the traveling public out there that are actually unaware uh, of what it is and, and what it does. Um, be, because, um, you know, you offer a kitchen, uh, you get discounts for the length, for the longer you stay. And uh, events, um, catastrophic events like the pandemic, displace people into these products that they were in some cases unaware of. And now things are getting back to normal, if you like, they've now discovered something. So in effect, um, events like the pandemic or Hurricane Katrina or uh, you know, any other natural disaster creates additional demand because it's created additional awareness. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Mark, yeah, please come in on that one. Uh, there, there's a, an interesting connection between two of the topics we've talked about so far, you know, we've talked about how, yes, in, in many cases, consumers are using extended stay hotels for, for shorter stays, simply out of, of loyalty or out of, out of interest in having more in their room. Uh, and at the same time, we've also seen that the, 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 the box has changed and that, you know, a, a typical extended stay hotel today, residents in, you know, would have 90% studio suites and, and then the remainder just one bedrooms, and so really, the, the the design of the box has has reacted to the behavior of the consumer, and as more and more of these hotels are are um, are filling up with people that are frankly not there for two two three weeks, but really you know two day two three days at most, um, they're trying they're finding ways of offering uh, a similar set of amenities in a in a more compact space, and that yeah. that that uh, that aligns well with you know, increasing land prices and other, other drivers for trying to shrink. Um, but certainly the consumer behavior is, is one of those drivers. Yeah, yeah. Matt, please come in on that point. Yeah, it was just interesting, you know, Mark mentioned about 10% of supply is extended, purpose-built extended stay hotels. I think the demand overall in the U.S. Um, is roughly 20% of overall room night demand is coming from guests that are staying seven plus nights. So that's, that's a massive supply demand imbalance. Mark, I think you mentioned that it's pronounced in mid-Atlantic, Northeast and West Coast. Um, but when you think about, that was, that was almost pre-COVID and coming out, of, coming out of COVID, you think about the, the emerging trends, whether it's the work from anywhere, remote worker, 
a quarter of all U.S. employees are still working remote, and that you know share is expected to double in the next five years. You know, we've seen that correlate to more frequent and longer lengths of stay, um, and then even things like the infrastructure bill. Um, it's driving room night demand from the core guests. So I think whereas there is that opportunity at the higher price points for the shorter term guests because of just product preference, I think what we're seeing is just a widening demand pie for true extended stay accommodations. So I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a great place to invest because despite supply growth, there's a lot of runway uh, for investors to continue to allocate capital to the, to the segment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kurt, did you want to finish off on that point? Yeah, I just I think in terms of that guest dynamic, you know, what we are seeing is that now the extended stay product is being used for for any number of reasons, right? It, it is that that blue collar construction. It's it's really anyone that has a life event that warrants uh, a need to be away from home for an extended period of time or become home for any any period of time. Um, we touched on the, the rising rent and homeowner costs earlier in, in the session. That's another you know, huge demand driver right now. Um, and so it is the segment of, of the industry that has demand significantly outpacing supply. And, and I think that's where, uh, you know, and that's why you're seeing such activity and then ultimately the performance you're, we're seeing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kurt. Well, I think we can probably all agree that the answer to our rather cheeky session title is no, the bubble isn't about to burst. There's, clearly huge demand and potential uh, untapped audiences out there. But I'm just going to ask you in turn what you think are the potential challenges facing the sector. Are there any bumps in the road uh, on the horizon? Um, Mark S, do you, would you like to kick us off on that one? Um, well, uh, I mean, a general recession um, which is being discussed more frequently now than it was a couple of years ago, would, uh, would certainly have, have some effect. Um, you know, the, the housing crisis, I mean, eventually supply and demand will, uh, you know, the, the current imbalance will, uh, will smooth out, but that's not going to happen in the near term. I mean, because one of it is a supply issue on the housing side and you can't just, you know, it's not a, a, a spigot that you can just turn on. Mm. Um, geopolitical events currently, um, I, you know, I, I would see that if it re results in reduced travel uh, and reduced international travel for some reason, affecting more the upscale segment than, than the lower price points. Um, that, um, you know, really, uh, in other words, the, the tailwinds are winning at the moment, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good that you're struggling to think of anything that's, uh, you know, a, a, a given. Anyway, Mark F., would you concur with that? It's always hard to, you know, read the crystal ball. I think that one thing that, uh, is particularly heartening about the segment we're in is that you know a, as uh, unforeseen events you know come up and the last few recessions have all been you know different in, in character but at whatever the reason for the recession whatever the, the character of it the extended stay has always weathered it better than its its peers and it was impressive to see over the pandemic how uh, you know so, so many extended stay hotels were doing 60% better ref bar than their, than their peers. Uh, in, in one quarter, you know, there, was a, there was one pair of brands where the extended stay product was doing twice, as, twice the ref bar of its transient peers. So it's, um, I, I think that part of the reason we populated a third of our portfolio with this stuff is that uh, we don't know what the future will hold, but we feel better going into the future with, with some of these assets in our portfolio. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Matt, would you like to share? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's a sign. I, I'm struggling to think of anything uh, other than some, you know, potential um, constraints on that long length of stay guest in certain jurisdictions being a kind of a potential challenge for the existing um, supply. But I think on the flip side, really the only challenge I see is more um, new supply being constrained by supply chain 
and rising construction costs that are affecting the underwriting and really the, the economic viability and hitting that return threshold for, um, for some of the investors that are looking at the space. Uh, but in turn, that I think makes me more bullish on existing performance because that supply demand imbalance is going to stay pretty wide then and, and allow for the continued strong occupancies, strong rev par, and most importantly, strong GOP and NOI. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Kurt, Matt, Matt mentioned rising construction costs, materials prices, and so on, which, which we're also seeing here in Europe. Um, one thing that the hospitality sector in general over here is really struggling with is recruitment just finding staff you know wages are going up um, but the people just don't seem to be there to fill a lot of roles um presumably this is again is another plus point for the extended stay sector particularly at the economy level because you don't need the levels of staff that you do higher up the price points yeah, I, I think it, in the economy and the select service space as a whole, compared to the upper upper price point chain scales, the staffing challenges are, are not nearly what, what they are. Um, you know, we, we expect these hotels to typically be run by a handful of people, you know, in total, um, you know, versus where you need dozens or hundreds in the upscale, you know, chains to, to actually operate a hotel that has F&B outlets and all the different amenities. Uh, you know, I think everyone kind of touched on in terms of or struggled to touch on what that that risk could be to the industry and i think what we would probably all agree with is that we may not be able to predict what it is but whatever it is will impact this extended state piece on a much lesser level which is what we've seen through the pandemic we've seen through any of the different recessionary periods and i think that's what gives all of us optimism for just the overall performance that we're seeing now and, and that should continue into the future yeah yeah well i think that's a great note to end it on thank you all gentlemen for your contributions. Just gonna show a couple of quick slides before we end the session. And we're also gonna show the countdown clock again because there's a lot of information in the chat. So we've got the LinkedIn um, contacts of all our fantastic panelists, um, as well as some other interesting stuff on there. So we're gonna leave the session open for a couple of minutes um, at the end. So the next service department news webinar is called the apartment of the future and this is where we're going to be looking at um, how the physical product is evolving uh, and the link to register for that is in the chat or you can also scan the qr code which is on the screen to register just a quick mention that our annual service department awards now in their seventh year are taking place in london on may the 10th if you'd like to find out more about those and buy some tickets it'd be great to see you there it's a fantastic uh, black tie do um, where lots of fun is had and you can see the web address there servicedepartmentawards.com if you're interested in sponsoring any of our webinars or our events please get in touch with my colleague katie whose contact details are on the slide and also in the chat And I'd just like to say thanks for watching. I think it's been a fascinating session. It's an incredibly strong segment of the market, and it's one that we watch with keen interest from this side of the pond. Uh, thanks to Mark S and Mark F, to Kurt and to Matt for their insights today. Uh, great to have you on, guys. Thanks to you all for watching. Thanks to IMS for sponsoring. And enjoy the rest of your days. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.